Bayou's Horrifying Secret, Part 6. Groggy and disoriented, I slowly regained consciousness. My ears were ringing, a relentless tinnitus that seemed to cloud my entire awareness. My vision was awash with splotches of glaring white, like a photographic negative. The flashbang had done its job and then some. As the world came into focus, a series of sensations bombarded me. The musky smell of damp wood, the stickiness of the swamp mud on my skin, and a sharp, sickening pain in my dislocated shoulder. Gradually, shapes started to form in the haze before my eyes. Gabby's face, gaunt and hollow, materialized in front of me. Are you okay? She whispered. Her voice was shaded with worry. It took me a moment to realize she was speaking. My ears still felt like they were stuffed with cotton. I opened my mouth to respond, but my stomach churned violently. Gabby seemed to anticipate this, swiftly handing me a bucket. I barely had time to lean over before I vomited, my insides twisting painfully. Setting the bucket aside, I couldn't help but notice the stench that now mingled with the overpowering odors of the hut. It was then that I realized what the bucket had been used for. Gabby had been in captivity for weeks. Is Ash, is my partner okay? I asked Gabby, a sense of urgency hardening the edges of my voice. Her eyes met mine and the grimness in her tone didn't need to be spoken. I, I don't know, she said. It was too dark. I couldn't see well. That wasn't the answer I wanted to hear, but it was the only one I had. My night vision goggles had been knocked off in the chaos, and I hadn't actually seen Ash's body hit the water. There's no confirmation, no certainty, just an agonizing void of unknowns. I refused to fill that void with the worst case scenario. I couldn't let myself believe that Ash was dead. I couldn't even comprehend a life without him. Suddenly, guilt crashed over me like a wave. I'd been a loose cannon, like Ash said taking unnecessary risks, letting my own demons dictate too many of our moves. Had my reckless behavior finally caught up to me, costing me the person I loved most in the world? I forced those thoughts to the back of my mind. This wasn't the time. Survival, mine, Gabby's, and hopefully Ash's, was the immediate concern. Forcing myself upright despite the intense pain in my shoulder, I looked at Gabby. My name's Rain. Your mom asked me to find you. A knot of emotion seemed to catch in her throat at the mention of her mother. Gabby's eyes filled with tears, both hopeful and devastating. Mamon, I've missed her so much, she choked out. Feeling the adrenaline still coursing through my veins, I braced myself against a wooden beam, my dislocated shoulders screaming in protest. I took a deep breath, gripping a low, hanging rafter tightly in my uninjured hand. The pain was a searing fire, and I needed to extinguish it now, more for the sake of function than comfort. I was useless in this condition. Well, what are you doing? Gabby's voice trembled, her eyes widening as she caught on. Putting my shoulder back in place. Don't worry, I've done this before. I tried to reassure her, although the cold sweat on my brow likely betrayed my stoicism. Turn away if you have to. This isn't going to be pretty. With a grimace, I positioned my shoulder under the rafter and used my good arm to apply downward pressure. The pain crescendoed, sharp and intense, pushing through every fiber of my being. I bit my lips so hard I could taste blood suppressing a scream. Then with a nauseating pop and a rush of blinding pain, my shoulder slid back into its socket. My legs wobbled and I staggered back, clutching my newly aligned arm which now throbbed in a dull ache rather than a sharp burn. The whole ordeal took mere seconds, but it felt like an eternity of torment. It still hurts like a motherfucker, though. I managed to gasp out, trying to mask the agony with a weak laugh. Gabby's eyes were wide, her lips trembling. I... I, I can't believe you just did that, she stammered. I had to. We need to find Ash and get out of here. The thought of my husband brought a renewed surge of panic and determination. Are you alright, Gabby? I asked, though the question seemed almost absurd given her obvious physical and emotional state. No, not really. But I'm alive, I guess, she replied, her voice tinged with despair. 
As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I knelt down next to Gabby and conducted a quick physical examination. My heart sank as I discovered the full extent of the atrocities inflicted upon her. Visible bruises and cuts littered her exposed skin, and her clothing was tattered and smeared with dirt and dried blood. As I ran my eyes over her body, I noticed a dozen different marks. Burns, claw marks, puncture wounds. Her eyes had a lingering fear in them, and her hands were shaking when I checked her vitals. What did he do to you? I asked as gently as I could. He likes my music, she began. He says it soothes his madness. He would come to me almost every night, listen to me play, and do other things. Her voice broke and the air grew thick with unspoken horrors. I knew there was nothing I could say that would make things right. The weight of what Gabby had been through was so much more than words could ever mend. I reached out and pulled her into a tight embrace, feeling her body shake with quiet sobs. She cried into my shoulder, and I held her there, providing a small, fleeting haven in a world that had shown her too much darkness. It's going to be okay, I whispered, though I wasn't entirely sure I believed it myself. The words felt hollow in my mouth, but sometimes even the thinnest thread of hope is better than none at all. After a few minutes, Gabby pulled away and wiped her eyes, sniffling. We need to go, don't we? We do, but first, we need weapons. Anything that can give us an edge, I said, scanning the dimly lit room. I don't think you'll find anything useful here, Gabby replied, her voice tinged with resignation. He stripped the place bare. We have to try. Look for anything sharp or heavy enough to swing. I'll try the door. I shuffled toward it, grimacing as each movement sent jolts of pain through my shoulder. It's no use, Gabby called out. The door is locked from the outside. Just then, I heard heavy steps approaching. Thinking on my feet, I rammed my elbow into the window of the cabin. Glass shattered, scattering shards everywhere. I quickly picked up a shard as the door creaked open. Gabby, get behind me, I whispered, positioning myself between her and the entrance. In stepped Lupin. His face was a grotesque amalgamation of man and beast, teeth bared, eyes blazing with a kind of unhinged fury. He looked like he was in agony. The smell of burnt fur and skin and gunpowder was overpowering. Stay back, I hissed at him. He grimaced, and it was hard to tell where the man ended and the werewolf began. As Lupin stepped further into the dim light, the play of shadows on his face highlighted the grotesque blend of human and monster. Yet, for all his terrifying aspects, there was a haunting sadness in his eyes. I instinctively recoiled in fright. Do you find my true form unbecoming, Mon Cal? He asked, a sneer tugging at the corner of his mouth. You looked better in the profile picture, I retorted, keeping my eyes locked on his. You survived my embrace, Lupin said his voice a coarse blend of human and animalistic tones. I'm impressed. What can I say? I'm full of surprises. I shrugged defiantly, my voice steady despite my racing heart. Lupin snorted, a sound that was more animal than man. I'd be careful, ma chérie. I'm not in the mood for games. Who's playing? My eyes darted around the room, taking note of the exits, the furniture, any potential weapon or obstacle. I locked eyes with Lupin, maintaining a steady gaze. You look like you've seen better days, Lupin. Or should I call you by your given name, Oigné Delacroix? Lupin's eyes narrowed, focusing on me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. You've done well to track me down, he said, his voice tinged with a perverse form of respect. Even uncovering my true identity, you're quite the investigator, Rain. So you've been keeping tabs on me? I asked the obvious. Ever since you arrived in the bayou, he confessed. It's nice being noticed, I suppose, I said, playing it cool. Ah, oh, Rain Tran, such an intriguing juxtaposition of names, he mused, rolling my name on his tongue like it was a delicacy. I always make it a point to know the names of my prey. It makes the hunt that much more intimate. My eyes darted to Gabby. She looked petrified but alert. She was ready to move at my signal. Enough about me, I said, gripping the edge of a table for support, my eyes never leaving his. Tell me, Lupin, 
What happened to you? Lupin seemed to weigh my question in the air before finally letting out a low, rumbling growl. What happened to me? A fitting question. The madness, you see. It's in the very marrow of my bones, whispering in the blood that courses through my veins. It calls to me, beckons me to satiate its insatiable thirst. His voice was hypnotic, and for a moment I was lost in it, but the atmosphere suddenly shifted, tension electric in the air. I noticed his stance waver ever so slightly. His eyes flitted unfocused, as if struggling with some internal agony. The flashbang had done more than just blind and disorient him. It seemed to have pushed his already precarious balance over the edge. He was vulnerable. Seizing the opportunity, I lunged forward, plunging the shard of glass into Lupin's eye with all the force I could muster. A guttural howl ripped through the room as my palm sliced open against the jagged edge. Blood spurted from both of us, mingling in the air before splattering on the floor. Run, Gabby, run, I yelled, grabbing her hand and making a break for it. I yanked open the creaking door and burst into the shadowy bayou beyond. Branches snapped under our frantic footsteps as we plunged deeper into the swamp, each desperate stride propelled by pure adrenaline. My lungs burned and the throbbing pain from my injuries was now a far-off drumbeat compared to the pounding of my heart. Come on, keep going, I shouted, more to encourage myself than her. Behind us, a guttural roar shattered the quiet of the night. Lupin was giving chase and he was fast, unnaturally fast. The sound of pounding paws and the splashing of water grew steadily closer. Every fiber of my being screamed to go faster, but the darkness was almost impenetrable. Navigating the maze of trees and vines was like running through an endless tunnel with no light at the end. Then, it happened. My foot caught on a gnarled root, and I was flung forward, losing my grip on Gabby as I plunged into a mud pit. Struggling to pull myself free, the muck sucked at my legs like quicksand, bogging me down further with every futile effort. Gabby, go. Run. I screamed, even as I felt the ooze reach my waist. No, I won't leave you, she cried. But her voice was cut short by the snarling growl that erupted from the darkness behind us. Lupin lunged into view, his features now an even more horrifying blend of man and beast. His uninjured eye was a molten cauldron of rage and madness. Summoning every last reserve of strength and determination, I gripped another shard of glass I'd kept in my pocket. If I was going down, I wouldn't go down easily. I'd make sure to give Lupin something to remember me by, to carve a part of me into him as he had done to so many others. Just as Lupin's muscles tensed for the deadly pounce, a series of gunshots reverberated through the swamp, loud as thunder. The bullets tore into his flesh, sending him tumbling sideways into the mud, a pained howl tearing from his throat. For a split second, time seemed to freeze, my heart pounding so loudly I could hardly hear anything else. From the shadowy maze of the swamp, a figure limped into view. Ash. My Ash. He was battered, bloodied, but very much alive. In his hand was a shotgun, its barrel still smoking. Our eyes met across the swampy clearing, and even though he looked as though he had just been through hell, his eyes sparkled with that familiar resolve. Don't you dare get up, Ash warned as Lupin struggled to rise. But the creature seemed hell-bent on continuing his rampage, his uninjured eye locked onto Ash with undiluted hatred as he began to push himself up from the muddy ground, snarling in a fluid motion. Ash closed the distance and aimed the shotgun point-blank at Lupin's rising form. Without a moment's hesitation, he pulled the trigger. The slug hit Lupin's arm with enough force to sever it at the elbow. The appendage fell into the muck with a sickening splash, and Lupin howled in pain and fury, finally slumping back into the mud, incapacitated. For a moment, the only sounds were our heavy breathing and Lupin's agonized whimpers. Ash turned toward me, the corners of his eyes crinkling in a mix of relief and exhaustion. Are you all right? He rasped, his voice tinged with emotion. I wanted to leap into his arms, to cry out in joy and relief, but the mud still held me fast. I've been better. I managed to choke out, my own voice tinged with disbelief that he was really there. Ash seemed to sense the urgency of the situation. Without a word, he extended his arm, gripping mine tightly as he pulled me out of the engulfing mud with a grunt of effort. My legs wobbled as I tried to regain my balance. 
I felt as if I'd just been plucked from the jaws of death itself. Ash quickly unslung the shotgun from his shoulder and handed it to me. Our fingers brushed for a split second as I took the weapon. There was no need for words. We both knew what had to be done. Take Gabby and go, I told him, my voice barely above a whisper. Get her to safety. I need to finish this. Ash glanced back at Gabby, who was trembling from head to toe but seemed ready to move. He looked back at me, his eyes filled with a mixture of relief and sorrow, as if he knew that no matter the outcome, things would never be the same. Rain, he started, but I cut him off. Don't, I said, looking away. Just go. He hesitated for a moment longer before nodding. Taking Gabby's hand, he led her away, his footsteps receding into the dark labyrinth of the swamp until they were swallowed by the night. Turning back to face Lupin, I circled him cautiously, my finger on the trigger of the shotgun. Every step I took was laden with the weight of what had been lost, what had been suffered, and what might still be lost if I couldn't end this now. He was wounded, half sunk in the muck, his one remaining eye following me. Despite his incapacitated state, he looked dangerous, unpredictable. The monster in him was only inches below the surface, but I sensed something else, something almost human, that was watching me, reading me. Tell me, Lupin, do you remember the names and faces of all your victims? I asked, my voice tinged with cold steel. His one remaining eye fixed on me, flickering with an emotion I couldn't easily identify. Guilt, maybe, or a warped form of regret. Why would you ask such a thing? His voice was raspy, strained. Answer me, I demanded, driving the heel of my boot into the open wound where his arm used to be. A scream of agony erupted from his throat, filling the swamp with the sound of his suffering. For a moment, I was sickened by the satisfaction that washed over me, a cruel pleasure in knowing that he could feel pain, that he wasn't invincible. His lips curled into a snarl, but the sound that came out was more a whimper than a growl. Yes, he finally admitted. I remember them all. Their faces haunt my dreams, their screams serenade my nightmares. Then you'll remember Claire Lusion, won't you? My voice was steady, but the name stirred a storm of emotion inside me. The flicker in his eye changed, darkening as he processed the name. Claire, he said, almost whispering, as if the very name would shatter him. Ah, uh, yes. The eyes that held a world too big for her small existence. A voice that should have sung lullabies, but instead only knew screams. My trigger finger twitched. Every fire of my being screamed to end him right then. What happened to her? My voice hardened, the shotgun feeling heavier in my hands. For a moment, the air hung heavy between us. Lupin's eye flickered, and I saw something in him break. Claire... He breathed, the word carrying a torrent of unspoken sorrow and shame. She, she fought, she had fire. But not enough to save her from you, I retorted, my resolve unwavering. Oh no, no, not enough. The monster in me, it's insatiable. It takes and takes, leaving nothing but death in its wake. She was no different. Do you know who I am? Who I really am? I asked, my voice dripping with a venomous calm that seemed to cut through the murky air. For a moment, his eye widened as if something crucial had just clicked into place. But then, he shook his head, the motion sluggish and impaired from his injuries. No, should I? He snarled. I felt a wry smile stretch across my lips. My name is Rain Lusion, I declared using my maiden name. Claire Lusion was my sister. As the weight of my words settled in the murky air, I saw Lupin's eyes widen ever so slightly, realization dawning on him like the morning sun over a blood-stained horizon. You have her gray eyes, he whimpered. You took her, Lupin. You kidnapped her, tortured her, and then you killed her. My sister, my baby sister. My voice trembled despite my attempts to keep it steady. Lupin's gaze wavered, a mixture of fear and remorse seeping into his eyes. For a moment, he appeared more human than monster, and I wondered whether the sliver of humanity that seemed to surface was genuine. I am many things, he rasped, his voice broken. But there is a part of me, 
a part buried so deep inside that remembers what it is to be human. A part that is disgusted by what I've done. He paused, his eye locking onto mine as though searching for some kind of absolution. It was the same look I'd seen on countless criminals. The look of someone who knew they were caught, who knew they were facing a reckoning they couldn't escape. As a former cop, my duty seemed clear. Arrest him, bring him in, and let justice be served. But the justice system was far from perfect. This was a being whose essence was split between man and monster, a creature of the night that reveled in the hunt and the kill. What kind of trial could accommodate such a dichotomy? What jury could ever understand the complexity of a life torn between humanity and primal urge? The thought of this monster being acquitted on a technicality or escaping to kill again was a risk I wasn't willing to take. Even if we could hold him, what prison could contain a werewolf? The shotgun felt heavy in my hands, its cold steel seeming to absorb the ambient moonlight. I lifted it, leveling the barrel at Lupin's head. My finger caressed the trigger, hesitant but determined. This was it. My moment of catharsis, my moment of justice for Claire, for all the faces and names he claimed to remember in his tortured dreams. Do it, he rasped, a bitter smile curling his lips. End it. End me. Maybe. Just maybe. In death, I'll find peace. And maybe you will too. A heavy silence hung in the air, one that seemed to drown out the sounds of the bayou, the rustling leaves, and the distant cries of creatures unknown. My thoughts flashed to Claire, to her laughter and joy, and then to the life she could have lived. For what seemed like an eternity, I stared into Lupin's eye, searching for something, anything, that might change my mind. Then, with a resolve hardened by years of regret, of missed opportunities and lost lives, I tightened my grip. Rendezvous en enfer. See you in hell, I whispered. The shotgun roared, its deafening blast reverberating through the bayou like the wail of an anguished soul. Lupin's head snapped back, and he slumped into the mud, lifeless, the last vestiges of his monstrous existence obliterated in a singular act of vengeance and justice. I stood there, the smoke from the weapon dissipating into the humid night, my body trembling from the aftershock of what I'd just done. I felt hollow, like a vessel that had been emptied, and yet was still laden with an invisible weight. But as I stared at the lifeless form before me, I felt something else too. Relief. And in that relief, I found a glimmer of the peace I'd been seeking for so long. With a grim sense of finality, I used the butt of the shotgun to push his lifeless form further into the muck. The swamp was known to keep secrets well. It would claim him, enveloping him in its fetid embrace until he was swallowed whole, leaving no trace. I was certain no one would ever find him. And if the bayou chose to keep this secret, who was I to argue? I turned away, taking a deep breath as I prepared to retrace my steps back through the bayou. Ash and Gabby were waiting, and there was a lot to explain, but for the first time in years I felt ready to face the future no matter how uncertain it was. As I walked away, I couldn't help but feel that I had reclaimed something that had been stolen from me, from Claire, and from all the lives Lupin had shattered. Justice had been served. But it was a justice born from darkness, wrought by hands tainted with the very evil they sought to destroy. And yet, as I emerged from the shadows of the swamp, I felt the dawn of a new day rising within me, a day where the names and faces that haunted my past could finally rest in peace. I found Ash and Gabby on the edge of the swamp, the floodlights of the airboat illuminating their anxious faces as they saw me emerge from the darkness. Gabby rushed into my arms, tears streaming down her face. Is it over? She whispered, her voice tinged with hope and fear. Yes, I assured her, pulling her close for a moment before releasing her. It's over. We drove Gabby back to her home where her mother, Therese, was waiting. 
The moment we pulled into the driveway, the front door burst open and Therese sprinted toward us, enveloping her daughter in a hug so tight it seemed she'd never let go. Through her tears, she thanked us, her voice breaking as she expressed her gratitude. I... I just... I don't know how I can ever repay you, Therese managed, her eyes meeting mine. You don't have to, I replied softly, then added, just take care of her. Returning to New Orleans, I resumed my relatively mundane life as a private eye. The days now consist of trailing cheating spouses, conducting background checks, and occasionally finding missing pets, tasks that seem trivial compared to the recent events in the bayou. Yet, the regularity, the humdrum routine, is a comforting balm to my frayed nerves. Our physical wounds eventually healed, but the emotional ones still feel raw. Ash, my one constant, knows my traumas better than anyone else. He never presses for details, never pushes me into reliving the dark moments that haunted my dreams. His love and understanding are an unspoken promise, a sanctuary where I can escape the horrors that my past and my profession sometimes conjured. Late at night, when sleep evades me and the faces of the lost wander through my thoughts, Ash will pull me close. We'll lay there in the darkness, two souls finding solace in the simple act of being together, of being alive. You okay? He'll often whisper. Yeah, I'll answer. Though, okay is a relative term. How can I ever be entirely okay? In the stillness of the night, as I drift between the waking world and the realm of dreams, a low growl resonates from the depths of my soul. A haunting echo that wasn't there before. A primal urge that calls me to the bayou.